hello, I'm back, and today I'm going to be talking about Matthew 25. I'm just going to be going through a couple of the parables in there, explaining some of their deeper meaning and why they matter so much. So what brought this to my attention was, well, let's say almost two years ago, I know it's a really, really long time, there's this guy called Raphael Warnock, and what brought my attention to Matthew 25 in particular is what he described himself as, saying, uh, You need look no further than Matthew 25. I'm a Matthew 25 Christian. That's what I am. And so I was really curious, like, let's explore Matthew 25. Let's figure out what exactly could you possibly mean by describing yourself as a Matthew 25 Christian. And so here I am, and let's get started with the first parable, which is going to be the parable of the ten virgins. All right, so I'll start from the beginning. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. I'll start immediately from here. So in this parable, we know everything in the parable has a meaning. Who could the bridesmaids be in this? Us. We're the bridesmaids. And the bridegroom will be Christ. Because remember, as suggested other parts of scripture as well, we are also going to be, well, the entire church as a whole will be the bride of Christ. And thus, bride, the bridegroom would be Christ himself. All right, let me continue a little bit further. Five of them were foolish, five of them were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. All right, before I go any further, I'm going to start breaking this section down here too. So, here we're talking about oil. What this oil represents is going to be like spiritual fervor, like the zeal you need to keep doing the things of Christ. And our lamps is our lives. You will need the oil to fuel the lamp, set that oil on fire, and thus the lamp will shine bright. Because remember, we are the lights of the world. So let me flick over to Matthew 5, 14 and 16. Real quick. And boom. You, so Matthew 5.14 goes, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. And Matthew 5.16 says, in the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to the Father who's in heaven. So that's what we're here to do on this earth. We are here to shine bright so that those around us may see the light and come to Christ. And so to expand on this further, I'll go a little bit into the Jewish customs of the time, which will kind of explain where this parable will come from and further emphasize its importance. So you've got to remember that they'll have a wedding ceremony, and after the ceremony, everyone will travel to the bridegroom's home for a banquet. In this case, this banquet is going to be like the one we'll have in heaven, which is called the marriage supper of the Lamb, and it's going to be referenced in Revelation 16, verses 9. No, 16 verses 6 to 9. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that these virgin bridesmaids were to wait at the bridegroom's home with the lamps waiting for everyone to arrive. In this case, it's going to be lamps because like, it's nighttime, it's dark, and it's supposed to be that waiting. So, why might these bridesmaids be virgins? The Jews had their own reasons. And in the case of this parable, the virginity of us, the bridesmaids, could symbolize our commitment to purity before the Lord as well. Why was some of the foolish in not having this oil? It's because if you've not got the spiritual fervor to keep shining bright, you are going to die out. It's going to dim out. Your light is going to dim out. And your witness is going to drop. That's the key problem. The moment you let, even for like a minute, a day, the moment you remove yourself from the power of the Holy Spirit and you leave yourself on your own without zeal, without the need, without feeling the need to do something for the Lord, your light will go out. And when the bridegroom eventually comes with the light out, so like this is when Jesus' is second coming, when Jesus comes back to find us sitting on our couches doing, I don't know, watching Netflix, gaming, just neglecting the will of our Lord. If Jesus comes back to find you neglecting the will of your Lord, it's bad news. In the case of the foolish bridesmaids, 
The foolish bridesmaids are the ones who aren't continually tapped into the Lord and His goodness and using the power from the Holy Spirit available to each and every one of us to continually do the will of God. And so here, let's go to the next bit. So as the bridegroom was delayed, aka we don't know when Christ is coming back, he could come back next week, next month, next year, even next century. We've got no clue. But we will know the season about. Anyway, as the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. So, if you do not come to seek the Lord now, before it is too late, as said in Isaiah 55, 6, seek the Lord while you still can. If you wait until the last final moments to start reliving your life for Christ as you should have been, you will find yourselves caught off guard and you will find yourselves locked out of the kingdom of heaven. It's quite a scary reality, but it's something which will happen and you've always got to keep in mind. Never leave Christ to the last minute because he never left you for one minute. Okay, so now we're going to go back to verse 11. So afterwards, the other virgins, so these were the foolish virgins, they came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. This phrase, I do not know you, or I never knew you, as referenced in Matthew 7, these are going to be like the scariest words you can ever hear in your life. Because the moment you hear these words, you know that any chance you had of being able to enjoy the rest of eternity with the all-loving, almighty, all-benevolent, all-good God are gone. This it's the moment, the moment you hear those words, is the moment you knew that no matter how seriously Jesus took the relationship to be with you, you didn't take it seriously enough to be with him. And that is the final cutting point where it is too late and you are eternally going to be separated from God as a consequence of your own actions, not of him. For we know that God does not want to banish people as like this but rather this happens because of your own actions and god will hand you over to the consequences of your own actions luke makes this abundantly clear in his own retelling of the exact same parable in verses 35 to 37 stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to, to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake, spiritually awake in this case, spiritually active, continually doing things for the Lord, etc., etc. When he comes, truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at the table and he will come and serve them. Because remember, this is the kingdom of God. Jesus doesn't act like the royals of this age who like to exalt themselves, rather in the kingdom of heaven, it is those with the highest authority who humble themselves below to the lowest place as servants and serve. Jesus did that on his ministry on earth, and he'll be doing similar things in the kingdom of heaven. So you've probably been wondering, where do we get this spiritual oil? Where do we get the zeal? Well, my answer to you is there's a couple of ways you can get the zeal. First off, there's... Bible meditation, so if you've not been reading enough of your Bible, I'd recommend just pick it up, read it for yourself. Your pastor shouldn't be the only one making it known to you. You should at least somewhat in your own time, even if it's for like, what, 10, 15, 20 minutes a day, or even like a devotional to start off with as a beginning, 
Get script, more of Scripture into your lives. After all, all Scripture is profitable for teaching and correction, as said in 2 Timothy 3.16. You've got to start reading it more. That's the first thing you can start with. You can also do prayer, communication with the Almighty God Himself too. And if you've got people around you, I'd recommend you get into a church, get into community, get in talks with people who are spiritually ahead than you, and ask for help and guidance from them. Like, once you do all these things, once you use the other people in the church, and you commune together, and you build each other up, you will naturally see this zeal build up as a result of that. So if not anything else, do those, and the rest will follow. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. All right, I'll, fil- I'll finish the elaboration of this parable with one verse from 2 Timothy 2.19. But God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. The Lord knows who are his, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. That's the easiest way you can start to shine your light, depart from sin, and remain in the presence of him who is all good and all perfect. As a child of God, when we name the name of the Lord, we are his representatives on earth. So everything we say and do matters. Because in everything we say and do, whether we know it or not, we are representing Christ. And so in this, I beg you, I urge you to stay close to him so that others may see him in you. I ask that you may curb your tongue, control your tongue, so that by your speech, he may stand out from others. I mean, in some places, even I'm guilty of this. There are some places where I could be a lot better in this, in this section, where I could probably be a lot more careful with what I say. Because like, this is a really sober reminder that people are constantly looking at you and your behavior to see what does it mean to be a Christian. What does it mean to follow Christ and why that matters? And this is why it's so important to take care of our oil, oil, to keep it pure, so that we may not be burning any impurities and showing those off as if they are from God, because we know they're not. And so once again, I remind you that we as Christians who bear the name and name the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we may depart from iniquity and that in doing so, we may shine as lights of the world. And so that is but one part of what it really means to be a Matthew 25 Christian. Keep that in mind and I'll be back with the other video. I'm going to put it in the playlist, which will probably show up about here. Or here, my bad. It's here. And so, without further ado, I will see you in the next video. Ciao.